first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show. I really, really am looking forward to this conversation. Um, so my name is Kshama Singhi. If you've not already guessed, I'm Indian origin. So I'm originally from India. I've been living in UK for the past 18 years, 19 years now. I've been living for, in the UK for a long time. Um, and I'm a Jay Shetty certified empowerment coach. Um, I also had another job. I have another job of digital marketing, but my passion lies in coaching. And what makes me different as a coach is, is the fact that I've gone through so many challenges in life. And I say challenges because that's what everybody feels like, but th those are lessons for me. I've gone through them. I've come out as a winner. And now I see other people going through the same things that I've gone through. So my passion is really about helping people going through the same relationship challenges that I've gone through. Thank you for sharing that. I know from coach to coach and person to person, it seems that many of us are in this industry because we went through something as we were discussing earlier, right? And we want to help people not maybe go through what we went through, maybe not make some of the mistakes that we made. But what I found, Shama, most importantly, is not to miss the red flags of the people that we enter our lives. So how did you get started in doing all of this and why is it so important to you? So I had, uh, so like I said, I've had so many challenges from quite early on in my life. I lost my dad at an early age and then I moved countries. I got married, all the corporate challenges, I think. But uh, the final thing was I was married for nearly a decade and my marriage fell apart. Um, I think that kind of pushed me into, it was the rock bottom for me. So that pushed me into making the change. Uh, I had this, when I was going through the divorce, I had this realization that I have to change something because I had a daughter and she was learning from everything that I'm doing. And for me, that was the biggest motivation that if I can change anything in her life, even if it's halfway there, and if I can stop the trauma and the pain from traveling to her, then I will do whatever it takes. That must have been tough to see your daughter understand maybe what you're going through because we take on sometimes the pain from our parents and then we replicate it and then unknowingly we pass it on to maybe our children and then they'll replicate it and then it just continues going there has to be that one person that's going to say enough is enough i want to make something different so when you're going through your difficult time in your marriage and then you're looking at your daughter do you, did you see yourself in her and what could have been if you didn't break the cycle? Yes, I saw it both ways, actually. So I saw me replicating what my mom was doing and some of the pain that she's carrying. I saw that. And even, even you know, sometimes it's really not our fault. You know, things happen to us and there is a reason why it happens to us. So I could see the pattern rep repeating. So first of all, I could see how I've taken on my mom's pain and then my daughter at that point was only like six, five or six. I could see some of the things she would say. And she's very innocent at that age. She doesn't really understand everything at that age. But some of the things she used to say, and I was like, oh, my God, I say that all the time. And that's when I realized that I need to, this pain is traveling through generations. This guilt is traveling through generations. So I need to do whatever I can to put a stop to it if I can. Was that something that you made it like your mission to do so? And was was it that important to you to make sure that it didn't get repeated? Yes. So that was the motivation. But I had two choices. I could either stay there as a victim, be miserable. And we spoke about this, right? Victim and victor, your words, victim and or victor. I could be the victim. I could stay there and make my life and my daughter's life miserable. You know, just unhappy life. Or I could do something about it and at least try to come out of it. So for me, it was at that point, it was I need to get out of this situation. In, uh, I need to get out of the pain, basically, so that I can give my daughter a better life. For me, when I was growing up, I saw many things I didn't like. And as I was sharing it, for those who, for, who follow my journey, growing up without my mother, my father, there's things that I realize now that I missed out on. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, change it just because the people I grew up around 
who taught me family, taught me culture, became so important to me that they're my true family because I always believe that we should be giving more importance to the family that we choose, the ones around us, not necessarily that the ones that we have no control over. For example, you can have a mother or father that treats you very poorly, but you're like, well, they're my mom and dad and it's okay. Whereas if there's someone on the street who's treating you the same way, you would even look at them the same way, right? So I try to judge people based on the behavior. So many of the clients that you do it, Shama, do you find them struggling with trying to understand what is it that they want out of their relationships and how to get it? Absolutely. I think the biggest challenge I've seen in my clients is lack of clarity. Uh, and I can say this from my own experience as well. We don't know what we want, what we need, and what are our own values. So this is when we get into a relationship or, you know, when not only a romantic relationship, any kind of relation relationship, when we don't understand ourselves, we are just listening to what the other people are saying. We are ju- we, we have a story that this is right, this is wrong, without really understanding why. And that's when everything starts to go wrong because you're just following somebody's footsteps, which may not be for you. So what happens in that case when you're trying to push them? Well, I shouldn't say push them because no one likes to be pushed, right? <laughs> what are some of the ways that you you get them to the point along that journey? Because I know for me, it wasn't easy in the beginning. But once I got some momentum and some success, then the later stages of those changes were a lot easier than the beginning. So how do you get them to understand that the journey is not going to be a one day thing, a 30 day thing? It may take a couple of years. Um, In a lot of cases, I don't get them to understand it's going to take a couple of years because a lot of people give up (laughs) if they think it's going to take me five years. What I do start with is small steps. I think And we spoke about this, right? It's the relationship. So uh, awareness, clarity is the biggest thing. And how do you become aware is by going inward, is by becoming aware of yourself, by understanding yourself, by understanding the relationship you have with yourself. Most clients that have come to me have always focused on the other. The fingers are always pointing towards somebody else, towards the situation. It's like they're the victim. It's not their fault. They don't take responsibility. Um, Nothing. It's all about them, 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 you know, and that's the biggest challenge. I think that's the biggest, I would say, the milestone for any coaching client that I've had. It's like when someone says, was like when a man breaks up with a girl, she's crazy. She did all these things, right? And when the girl breaks up with a guy, he's good for nothing. He's a deadbeat. He's useless, right? But it has to be a little bit more than that because that would mean that every single person who's ever had a bad relationship is either crazy or useless. (laughs) Except except myself. Everybody else is crazy. I'm the perfect one. Right. Exactly. They, they, right. I'm the um, for those who are religious, I'm Jesus. I'm you know, I'm the prophet here where everyone else, they can't go bring up to my level. And for me, when I looked at when I would hear that, it would kind of make me laugh because you don't realize, I guess they don't realize how crazy or how preposterous it sounds to think that there isn't anyone on your level. And one example I, I like to give people is that. Think of it as like a pond where each of us are in our own pond and we want to attract someone to come into that pond to, for whatever the reason, right? But before we can attract someone into that pond, the pond has to be attractive itself. It can't be toxic. It can't be filled with bugs. It can't be any of these things. So I think to your point, maybe some people become comfortable in their own filth, like pigs, like a pig in mud. And I think instead of changing, they rather blame because it's easier to blame than it is to change. Like if I want to become the type of man that, let's say you, Shama, for example, you had a description of the type of man that you want. If I want to meet that, there's certain things that I would have to change. And there may be certain things that I already have. And if someone wants to be with me, that, that woman would have to meet the certain standards I have as well. But I think the, the piece that's missing in a lot of people's minds when they set standards for others, they don't have standards for themselves. Yeah. Right. Do you have those conversations as well? 
Yes, absolutely. So I think the kind of conversation, especially with women that I have is a lot of them like self-confidence. So for example, for my, if I talk about my story, I was married for nearly a decade and I was married to a narcissist. And for me, it's very easy to say, oh my God, he's the one to blame. And I still say that sometimes, but the fact is that I attracted a narcissist in my life because my level of confidence, self-confidence, self-worth was so low. So I naturally, you know, there's something about me that is naturally attracting a narcissist in my life and attracting and keeping. Not only am I attracting, I'm also keeping up with the nonsense. I'm keeping up with lack of boundaries, you know, because of my own self-worth, because of my low confidence. So somehow we've missed that piece that there is a reason why we're attracting the kind of people we don't want to attract. I think I think that's a very important piece that a lot of people miss is that when you're at your lowest point, that's when you attract the people that are going to be the worst for you. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what gets missed because to use your example, um, narcissists, they wouldn't go after someone that's overly confident, very successful and has everything going for them. Yeah. They're going to go for the person that they kind of shrug when they're walking. They're not as confident. You can read that they're going through some type of trauma. Then they're going to come in and try to appear like they're the savior yeah. of this person, right? Because in the beginning, what do they do? They love bomb. Yep. Shower you, shower you, shower you. are so pretty. You're so nice. Oh, my God. How come no guys are, are with you? How come they're not chasing after you, right? And then it's going to feel good, especially when your confidence is low, because now instead of you being the only person that's building you up, you have this other person that's building you up, but maybe they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Do you find that to be some of the traps that the women you deal with fall into? Absolutely. And this is where, you know, we talk about validation. This is where when we need external validation, especially women, we fall into, I think even for men, it's true. When we need external validation, we fall into this kind of a trap, uh, you know, and again, coming back to the narcissist point, if I were that confident person who knew my boundaries, who knew my word, he would probably, I would, I could still possibly attract a narcissist in my life, but he would not stay in my life because I would say, no, this is not okay with me. I would say, no, this is how things are going to be done in my life. You know, if you're going to be a part of my life, this is how way things are going to be. But because I didn't set those boundaries, I kept him in my life. So one is attracting and then the other part is keeping him because I constantly needed that external validation. At some point, I stopped getting the validation, but I still still kept holding on to something that happened in the past. To the love, the initial love bombing that he did, I thought it's going to happen again and I'm going to feel good about myself again. I know some people, I knew someone that she needed validation so much and I think it stems from maybe a previous relationship or previous relationships where she would go out of her way to get the validation. And it put her in a difficult situation because when she was trying to date the men that she would date, they couldn't give her enough validation because she wanted it from everyone, right? And what she would do is she would put up certain pictures and videos on social media, right, for that attention. But her justification was that I'm not going to do anything with these people. But she wasn't thinking and seeing it that, well, do they know that? Yeah. Right. Does the person you're with know that? Because when you're in a relationship with someone, what you're doing impacts not only you, but impacts that other person. When you're single and free, Shama, who cares, right? <laughs> you can do whatever it is you want. If you want to put yourself naked online, that's your prerogative, right? That's between you and, and obviously yeah. the community guidelines of that social media platform, right? But when you're in a relationship, a committed one, a long-term one, a marriage, then it's a little bit different. And I think sometimes based on the personality type, there's a lot of men and women who struggle with that because their thinking is that I can always stop it before it gets too far where the conversation should be. Why let it get to a point where you have to stop it anyways? Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, and I, it's funny you say this because I don't know, Terrain, if you've, uh, you've tried the online dating environment today, so-called online dating environment. 
I mean, it is so easy to find those examples, yeah. And especially as a woman, it's like you know, I've come across men who are married, and they don't reveal it and they don't think they are lying in their head they're like yeah it's fine we are not in a serious relationship you know so i'm not cheating neither my wife neither this person and actually it is it is cheating actually like you said you know you are in a committed relationship you know you have some sort of responsibility you need to take ownership you need to take responsibility and you need to own up your situation be clear about who you are and what you want with everybody in your life uh, so it's so easy to find those kind of people. Um, um, it's hard, by the way. And, I've, and again, we were talking about this, right? It's very hard to coach people like those because they don't want to take responsibility. They think they're entitled to whatever they're doing. I find that to be the part that's a little bit difficult because if you were to turn it around on them, right, Chama, and say that if your partner was doing this to you, would you like it? The answer is always no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're OK doing it to others, but they're not OK doing it to them. And another example is I told someone, are you the type of woman that you would want your son to bring home? And she said no. Mm. And, then, and then I asked her, I was like, so why do you feel that you're good enough for someone else's son to bring home? Yeah. She didn't have an answer. And I think that's where the struggle is for a lot of people, because their view is only outward meaning that it's from their perspective outward but they're not able to see inward so maybe what's some of the commonalities that are preventing your clients from finding maybe the success sooner than later in their life um i think it's the uh it's the generation that we are living in oh, and i would say a couple of generations before us as well a change is happening. I don't know if you've noticed this terrain, but I think there is a change happening. People's way of thinking is changing, but ever so slightly, slowly. You know, it's not fast enough for me, <laughs> at least. Uh, but it is changing. People are starting to see this. I think uh, the problem is not, uh, it's not, the problem does not start today as, as a grown up or even as a teenager. The problem starts from the time we are born. And sometimes even before that, it's the society that we live in. What is the society teaching you? What is the society telling you? And I say, for example, when my, when I say my self-confidence was very low, my self-worth was low, is partly due to the culture that I was coming from, where they, where, you know, it, it's, a, it's a cultural thing that women are supposed to sacrifice, women are responsible to, for keeping the house together. But how? How? We don't know the how. You know, so we make our own assumptions and we land up doing things that are so harmful to us and to the others, to be fair. You know, so I'm not, I think the problem is not today. The problem is day one or even day zero. You know, we, we, we are just taking on the cultural thing, the societal thing, even when we move countries, our friends, our families. And this is what you were saying, right? It is so important to surround yourself with the right people because Whoever you have around you, you're going to be the fifth one of that. So how do you, how do we fight back against that? Because that's a programming that maybe is from our childhood um, yeah. generation. So how do we push back and say, I want something different. I want more. Uh, I think uh, in cases where I've found success with my clients is when there is a good motivation. Uh Again, coming back to my example, I knew I had a strong motivation. I had a why. Why do I want to change is because there was a very strong motivation. As a mother, I could do anything for my daughter, you know. So I had the strong motivation. This is most of the times, you know. Some clients feel like, oh, I can't live alone anymore. Okay, then let's change things. Let's not be single anymore. If that's what you want, let's change things. But the change has to come from within. It, it's what what uh, I think Dr. Wayne Dyer, I think he says this is, when you squeeze a lemon juice, a lemon, you're going to get lemon juice. You can't get orange juice because what's inside is going to come out. So what's inside needs to change so that when you get squeezed, when you're put under difficult situations, you're giving out the person, you're becoming the person you want to be with. And I find that is probably something that's very difficult because change can be very scary for a lot of people and it's 
I think when we go through a traumatic situation, it's easier to change because in a way we're forced, right? Yes. Like if someone were to, let's say if I was, let's take away from relationship, let's say if I was attacked in the street, right? On a, a specific route back home, I'm forced to change in a way that I would walk a different way home. Yeah. Right. Even though let's say for years now, I felt that that path home was always dangerous. It took something to actually happen to me for me to change it. Similar to like relationships, it's, and we talked about this, right? Where I'm dating the wrong girl. I'm like my last 10 relationships, they all ended badly. At what point do I make the change and say, hey, the type of women that I'm looking for and or attracting or attracting isn't for me. I need to change something. Instead of me just sitting back and saying, you know what, Shama? No. The world needs to change. The world has to fit me. Yeah. Right? Versus me fitting the, the world. You made a good point that I want to double back on when you mentioned um, online dating. I was I did online dating many years ago. I want to say maybe like 10 years. Okay. Right. So yeah, so pretty much I guess when it was in like its infancy in a in a yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and I do remember that it was unusual just because of the of the number of people that you could potentially meet or at least have a conversation with, right? Um, I'm pretty much old school. If I were to go to a grocery store and have someone attractive, you have a conversation, either it goes somewhere or it doesn't, right? But that's maybe one person, maybe two person a day. Exactly. Online dating, you have hundreds exactly of people right so how do you how do you help us to navigate through just a sheer volume and trying to find a successful relationship whereas some people may say it's like a needle in a haystack you have one good person among hundreds if not thousands yeah yeah i think uh, there's no there's no one word answer to this i mean this this is not as straightforward because there are a few steps to getting to that stage uh, is first of all, like I said, if you don't know what you need, what you want, what are your values? And I call it something like non-negotiables, you know, you might have a long list of things that you might need or want in a partner, but then some of them are just non-negotiables, you know, that if he doesn't respect me in my case, I'm sorry, it's a no-go for me. If he is married, I'm sorry, it's a no-go for me. So those non-negotiables, if you're clear in that, then you're very clear that these are my non-negotiables. If this person does not match any of these criteria, just don't even swipe. And, and sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know till the time you talk to them. But, you know, you, you're very clear. You know, that's the first step. You're very clear of what do you need as a person, what do you want as a person, and what are your values? Marriage thing, I was I was surprised how many people have told me that they found married people on there, and and some of them will say that, um, oh, I'm I'm separated, and you know, even though we still live in the same house, <laughs> things like that. I went. Hey, there, there, there was someone I went on a date with years ago. She said she was. Um, they were still married, but they they're separated. I'm guessing they're separated, and they still lived in the same house for financial purposes. So I made the joke. I was like, so when it reaches, let's say, date number three or four or five, right? And you want to bring the person back to your place. Who's downstairs? Who's upstairs? <laughs> right? Because they, they can't be the same bedroom, right? <laughs> right? So it, like, how do you, like, how do they, I'm always wonder how do they navigate that dynamic? Like, have you come across where you're trying to help someone who may be, is dating someone that is separated, but they still have this kind of unusual setup in their life. Yeah. yeah. It comes back and I, I I sound like a broken record right now to rain, but actually it comes back to what do you want? So there are some women who want uh, to just have fun and that's okay. That's what they want. There's no right. There's no wrong. But as long as you're clear that that's what you're in for, it's fine. But if you're somebody who wants a, a, a committed relationship, a decent relationship, then you shouldn't be talking to that person. Simple. I think it again comes back to what do you want? If this is what you want, this is your worth, then why are you even entertaining the thought of being with somebody who's already married, who doesn't know what his future with that relationship looks like? So you, in a way, you're the extra over here. you know. And if you have enough self-worth, why would you want to be the extra? 
That's a good point. That's a good point. And I think that's something I wish I had like a, a universal answer to. Like, why would someone choose to be second place? Yeah. Right? And there's, a, there's probably a number of reasons, right? The loneliness. Yeah. Right? Like, if I have a choice, I'm using you as an example. Let's say you are married, right? But you, for whatever reason, you're interested in things outside of your marriage. And I know that I've spent the last 10 years alone. I can't get a date. I haven't been intimate with someone. I can't remember the last time I hugged someone. And then you come along, I'm thinking, okay, there has to be a compromise somewhere. Do I compromise my morals and be with Shama because at least I'm around someone? Or do I continue to be alone in my cold bed, cold house, right? So I can see maybe that internal struggle with men and women who sometimes they get caught up because things are going so well. And it's like hands off, right? It's hands free. We meet up when we can. There isn't any drama. You're not calling me all the time. I'm not texting you all the time. It seems on paper like an ideal situation, but the longer that goes, the higher the risk, right? The risk is only if that's not what you want. See, if 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 you're fine with having fun, like you said, you know, it's hands free. It's it's. Uh, easy you know what the situation is he knows what the situation is it's working for both of you fine but if that's not what you want eventually you want to be either in a relationship uh then why even go down that road why why even give him six months why even give him one month forget six months you know why give that relationship so much time and a lot of the times terrain the reason being is we're coming from this uh, space of scarcity you know and fear that if we lose him, to your point, you know, you've been alone for so long that if somebody comes and gives you a little bit of love, a little bit of whatever you need, you feel you're never going to get it again. Which is again why you need to work on yourself. You know, you want to be in that situation that even if you're alone, you're not lonely. And when you can reach that situation, you will attract the right person. It's like if I'm limping, and I attract another guy who's limping, what's going to happen is both of us are going to limp together. <laughs> you know, how is that going to work? Who's going to help who? You know, so this is what we're doing in our relationships. You know, we are limping. We need to stop limping and cure ourselves first so that we can attract somebody who's fit as well. Emotionally fit as well. I'm not talking about physical fitness, but, you know, emotional, emotionally fit as well. And when we stop limping, terrain when we become confident when we stop being lonely even if we're alone we come out of this uh, the scarcity mode that we are in oh i'm going to find so many you know sometimes dating apps help because there's so many it helps you come out of the um the scarcity mode but actually yeah in the long run it doesn't but that's the thing you know there's plenty of people you just need one person in your life and there are billions of people out there. There are billions of men, billions of women. To your point, if not from one city, then another city, then another country. You know, you've got the whole world. <laughs> yeah, the the parameters have definitely changed. Maybe in our parents or our grandparents' day, it was like the neighborhood. Yeah. Right? The yeah. city was the, the, the limit. Now, how many of us are even dating someone that's in our city? Right? Like, office romance is still the number one way to meet people. And a lot of times the people at work don't even live near you. They live 30 minutes, 40 minutes, another way, right? They live because the, the job is the, the focal point. It's the center of the dating universe, right? We have someone that's in the North, the South, the East, the West. And you made some good points when you're mentioning that it comes down to what you want and how you're able to get it. Do you find it difficult for people to tally up what it is exactly what they want so they can work towards achieving it yes yes and partly because they think what their parents want for them or what their friends want for them is what they want they don't realize what they actually want so it it becomes it becomes very hard i mean the concept of self-awareness is very new to some people the concept of I don't want a man who looks like this and who earns so much money, et cetera, is very 
is is very unheard of for some people you know uniqueness is not common you know wanting somebody something different from what all your friends want is is it requires a lot of self confidence and courage to say actually this is not my type my type is something different it might not be your type but that's fine with me so yes i think self awareness this whole concept you know just getting them to become more self aware i like i said the first step is the hardest is the awareness is the hardest of all so i want to touch on what you went through since you mentioned that because i i really i understood how difficult it was for me to be self aware to understand that the type of women that i was attracting weren't good for me and one of the reasons for that was because i wasn't the man i needed to be at that age granted i was young but i was still an adult in my 20s and i find a lot of times that the people i work with they think in your 20s you're still a kid whereas you're an adult they we've extended our adolescence from 0 to 17 0 to 18 to 0 to like 30 yeah 0 to 35 Right, and for some people, thirty-five years old. For those listening, if you don't know, thirty-five is for a lot of people midlife. <laughs> well, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're not fifty percent kid, <laughs> and then fifty percent adult, right? Yeah. But the reason why I want to I want to say that is because I needed to understand the self awareness, and then I need to make a conscious effort. Yeah. For you, you were. you had something that i wasn't able to achieve at that age you had the marriage you had the 10 years and even though i grew up around a culture that you called your own there's the culture dynamic in um how you navigated as well your relationship was it difficult for you to find yourself after the marriage in the way that you wanted to be successful in Yes, everything was difficult. I mean, so so we have and I I I can say from my point of view and this is also I'm mirroring a lot of my clients as well. We have certain set of belief systems, you know, we believe certain things like for example, a good mother should be x y and z, you know. And in my head it was like, oh, I'm a mother, I'm a good mother, I shouldn't be working so much, I should be spending more time with my daughter or I shouldn't be having boyfriends, etc., etc. So we have this narrative, this story, this belief about who we should be how things should be you know for me first of all the fact that i was getting divorced culturally although it was becoming more common it was still not okay with me i mean it was a big thing you know for me it was like my world is coming to an end i couldn't see beyond divorce at some point i was like i don't know what to do anymore i don't know how to live anymore i don't know what my future is going to be so of course it was difficult and then just being open to dating somebody new it took me years years to just be open that i can have somebody else in my life you know but my belief about oh i'm a mother i shouldn't be doing this i shouldn't repeat what her dad did you know her dad went and found somebody else i shouldn't be doing that poor daughter this that and everything. all the belief system all the rubbish that was in my head was ruling my life why do you and- think you found it difficult to date soon afterwards when you got divorced i think uh, soon afterwards and i would and this is what i recommend to all my clients as well we need to when we're in a, in a situation whether be it a bad relationship or even in a bad job for for example we need to understand what happened we need to digest we need to feel the pain and we need to learn the lesson if we don't learn the lesson we're going to do the same thing again We have, I'm going to attract the same kind of a guy. I'm going to have the same relationship with different people. If I didn't take that time, and I didn't do this on purpose, it just happened. If I hadn't taken that time out to understand myself, to understand that my self confidence was the problem over here, and what can I change moving forward, I would have been in the same relationship again and again and again and again. That probably would have been. devastating for you right because when i look at it i just imagine if i've had a string of relationships that ended poorly but they weren't consistent they weren't consecutive I meaning wasn't one after the other after the other 
yeah, it was yeah. maybe um, girl number one, then girl number three, then girl number six, whatever the case is, right? Making up numbers. Not that I, I date so many different people. <laughs> I want to make that clear, everyone. I'm not like, you know, some kind of crazy guy out here that's just, just dating everyone. But I had to learn. And I remember when I had a relationship that ended poorly, I had to take some time. And I took about a, just over a year. And the reason why I took a year is because I want to understand me. Right. And I did that in a way because I was thinking, I have a pretty decent job. I have the education. What am I missing from a relationship perspective? Because on paper, you can check every single box. Yeah. Right. But when you mesh your resume, your dating resume with someone else's, it doesn't jive. And that's okay. That just means that that person isn't for you. But sometimes we make it seem like that person is a bad person. Not necessarily. They didn't treat you badly. It's just once you got to know them a little bit, you understand that they're not for you, right? Would yeah. you would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's not enough. It takes a couple of meetings, a couple of, I don't know, activities together to understand a person. And I think and back, coming back to the belief system, this was one of my belief system that if I am seeing somebody next, I should be with him for a relationship, a committed relationship, you know? So the fact that I have a choice was not an option for me at that point because of my own belief system. How did you navigate around that to understand that you do have a choice and you kind of developed new belief systems? Um, I think the more I worked on myself, the more, more my mind opened to new ideas and new possibilities. I have to say I had a very strong support system. My family was very supportive. And all of us need that support system. If it's not your family, it has to be your friends. If it's not your friends, it has to be some meetup groups or anything, some networking events, some coach, mentor, whatever it is. I think uh, my, my support system was very, very good that allowed me to take the steps that I was not comfortable with. I wasn't feeling judged. I wasn't feeling like if I make a mistake, my family is going to disown me, for example. I wasn't feeling that. So which is why I got the courage to try new things um, and even fail at new things. But one thing I want to say is, like you said, you took a year to understand yourself. I can say it took me three to four years to get out of my own misery. So there is no... There is no time limit to people who are healing, to people who are understanding themselves. Let's not rush into it. So don't feel under pressure that you have to do it within a year. You have to do it within a one month or two months. So take as long as you need, because some people are coming from very strong belief systems. You know, it's very hard for them to change. So what I'm trying to say is everybody is different. So some for somebody, it might be one month. For somebody, it could be two years. Or for me, it was three to four years. Yeah, the, the time to recover from that is different. And there's there's that joke, right? The best way to get over someone is to get under someone. Yeah. <laughs> some people, right? They some people immediately go to to sex. And there, there's there's people out there. That's how they resolve everything. Right? Like they resolve every conflict through sexual activity, um, every grieving period through sexual acti- activity, because it's the easiest thing to offer someone. Yeah. Right, and you're gonna, and we talked about right. You're gonna get that attention immediately. Like if a girl who just, if a woman who is newly divorced, right, she steps outside her house and she says, "Gentlemen, I am divorced. Whoever wants me can come and get me." There's gonna be a lineup around the neighborhood, yeah, yeah. for her, right? Yeah. Now, if a guy were to do that, eh, maybe a few girls, maybe. <laughs> right so the dynamics is a little bit different because when it comes to the healing if you're if part of your healing is strictly to get validation and attention i think women more so than men are going to have that in in spades in abundance yeah right because it's it's easier for them to to, to pull it and women tend to um take their emotions more strongly in general than men do so they're going to feel the suffering yeah. as you mentioned a, a lot more right so I think taking your time to understand what your needs are from a mature perspective. Yes, we all have into intimacy needs, but is that appropriate for what you're going through? 
The answer is probably not at that point. So when you look at your client, Shama, because this is something that I've always asked myself and it always brings a smile to my face. How much of yourself do you see in your clients that you help? Oh my God. So one of the things, in fact, I was uh, talking to one of my friends last week and I'm sure you will understand this as well. When I decided to become a coach, what I didn't realize was I am taking on this lifelong personal development process because sometimes my client is a mirror of me, you know, and some it's unreal. There are times, and for me, it's probably a smaller space. So, you know, I might be having some issues with my daughter, for example, and my client comes and she might be having the same issue with her partner. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is not good, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, sometimes like, why did I become a coach? Why? I shouldn't have, but it is unreal. You know what they say, you land up teaching the things that you need to learn the most, you know? So yes, my past, I've learned, but then this is this constant learning for me as well, you know? And I, I'm not perfect. I still have a long way to go. I'm learning. I'm just probably one step ahead of somebody else. That's all, you know? So um, I'm not perfect and I'm still learning. So for the for the ladies that you work with, what are your next steps in how you want to assist them and maybe assist others in the world today? Uh, so I would, so I strongly believe, uh, Terrain, that uh, we can bring about a ripple effect. And it's much easier to work with women because they are more coachable, nothing against men, maybe because of my style, maybe because I'm a woman. I don't know. That's what I found. <laughs> uh, so, and they also have a lot of power to change things in their family. So coaching is a ripple effect. So which is why I work a lot with women. I have a few male clients, but mainly women. Um and there is a lot, there are so many ways I work with them. There are so many different things. So I've got things like group coaching. I've got one-to-one -one coaching. Um, I've, uh, I've, again, I've also got, got these, you know, express coaching, which is basically, if you don't know if coaching is for you, you can try it out before really signing up for a long-term coaching program. So there's a lot of ways, uh, but I'm also offering free eBooks. So I do a lot of writing, a lot of podcasts. So anybody, please follow me on Instagram. Please subscribe to my email. And you'll get a lot of free resources from me. Perfect. And all that will be included in the show notes and the description. So as we close, what are some final words that you want to give my audience out there looking to find love, happiness, and success in all the right places? Um, start with yourself. Start with yourself and you'll be amazed. Things, and, and Terrain, you said this, I think, before. It is difficult to begin with. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. Trust me, this is the only way to find happiness and peace. <laughs>